MPs don't get sabbaticals, but when Parliament broke up for this summer, for the first time in 30 years as your MP, I took some real time off. I was sailing, camping, walking in Scotland, albeit with my laptop and iPad in regular use to keep up with my office and the workload. But this gives you time to think, to reflect on politics, on the responsibility that rests on an MP, and to reflect on your constituency and the people you represent in Parliament, on the state of your nation, of your world, on the future of your planet, and on the things and the people you know and serve, and on those you love the most. This is also the fifth local hot debate, so brilliantly inspired and led by Jill Bruce and those who help her, for which we should all be so grateful. And Zoom makes this more national or even international than ever before. If you've been coming to these debates year after year, nobody can possibly claim we have not learned so much. Learning changes you. And changes growth. Like plants, unless the human spirit within you keeps growing, you are dead and you lose your connection to the earth. By learning and growing, you change and then you have to embrace the profound change in your outlook and priorities which the global crisis demands. This year, the UK is still emerging from the Covid crisis, which was a hammer blow that reminds you that the successes of the human species, such as population growth and mobility and scientific advances, are also the cause of vulnerability. This year, you have yet more evidence of how that success if it deserves that name, threatens the very existence of humankind unless we all change our ways. If you travel to the same part of Scotland year after year and live close to nature as is possible when you are there, you notice the subtle changes in the wildlife and habitat, which today seems much diminished from when you were a child. This year, there were no swallows in the special places where we usually go. Another talisman of something going terribly wrong with what my father used to call the balance of nature. You know now that such balance, if it exists at all, is easily upset. This year, your summer was interrupted and disrupted by another crisis caused by the West's retreat from Kabul. 20 years after 9-11, you see democracy in retreat, extremism and international terrorist organisations jubilant. The West fragmented and with democratic debate in so many countries torn between demagogic populism and desperation. This is a strategic failure for the UK and for NATO, which started out so united 20 years ago. This year, you also probably watched Sir David Attenborough 
deliver his lifetime witness statement about the decline he has seen in the natural world. Perhaps like me, you are left wondering if the West gives up on a country like Afghanistan, which has less than 40 million people today, just because it is too hard and takes too long. How is the West going to address the needs and effects of the projected 4.3 billion people in just the continent of Africa, as the world's population is forecast to rise from 7 billion today to 11 billion? Instead of rising to this challenge, you see the West retrenching. It is now time to challenge how your government will form your country's national strategy so that at least the UK can develop a more coherent and integrated response to every aspect of government which impacts on your long-term freedom and security and prosperity. National strategy must also address how your government can influence other nations to think the same way. So this year is the year of COP26. Either all this is a prelude to yet another international round of hot air and failure, or we must come to terms with the truth. At the moment, we are using up our planet. Since the 1990 baseline, the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere has been going up at an increasing rate. Global emissions rates have roughly doubled. Far more fossil fuels have been burnt in the past 30 years than in the entire 19th century. Humans are still literally burning up your planet. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Emissions Pathways are inherently uncertain. However, under their intermediate projections, humans will burn more carbon in the remainder of this century than in the whole of human history. Humans are also despoiling the natural world on a monumental scale. As the population nearly doubles by 2050, this will accelerate. They are squandering what there is left for no other reason that they have always done the same and do not know how to stop. There's plenty of reason for hope. Look at the reforestation of Borneo or the establishment of marine reserves in vast areas of ocean around St Helena, the Galapagos or Belize, or the international agreements to protect Antarctica, or the UK's success at reducing our own carbon emissions. Technology also provides much hope. Everyone knows what needs to be done to save your planet as a place where your children and grandchildren might have a chance to survive. But governments poorly demonstrate that they know how to do it, or that they are giving it sufficient priority. Public confidence is sagging. Modern government requires better leadership, both at home and abroad. Politicians fear voters will react against the measures which are simply imposed upon them. Politicians often underestimate voters' appreciation of complicated issues. But if you explain the facts, and instill public confidence in what the government can do, they will support you. But first you need a system which supports ministers which will generate much more coherent thinking and understanding and explaining about what needs to be done and why. Then, and only then, can the whole population be engaged in a way which commands their confidence. The challenges are huge. There must be intercontinental cooperation. At the same time, democracy and human rights must win the international competition of ideas and values. They are threatened by many governments who see advantage in global disorder, who want to overthrow the network of relationships, markets and international institutions upon which the whole of global security and prosperity has rested since the end of World War II. It may seem late, but I find myself dedicating my next years in politics to this task, that the UK should be enabled and that your government should be held accountable in order that it grows the capability and capacity to develop national strategy, the ends, ways and the means towards a viable future which your children and your grandchildren deserve to inherit.